I first have to say something about the um, title of uh, my presentation, which uh, is the result of a certain confusion. Uh, when I was invited to this conference, I offered I could either do something about uh, political economy in Marx after Mega, or I could do some uh, notes about biographical problems because I'm just preparing a three-volume biography. And from this either or, at uh, the end uh, resulted a combination that I would uh, here present um, something about uh, the intellectual biography of uh, political economy. So, I was a little bit surprised about this when I, when I learned this, but nevertheless I will try um, now to fulfill this uh, uh, strange synthesis which I didn't really um, offer. Um, but first also I want to, to correct at least one point you, you mentioned about myself. I'm not anymore working in a German university. I quit uh, this job in order to be able to finish this uh, three-volume biography. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. So, when we talk now about Marx, it was already stated uh, in, in certain introductions that Marx still today has to tell us uh, important things about capitalism. But why this is possible? The guy uh, lived 150 years ago. And uh, there are enough authors who try to convince us Marx is a guy of 19th century and he has nearly nothing to say to the problems of 20th or 21st century. I think this is wrong because the 19th century is a very specific century. It is the century in which the modern structures of society, of modern capitalist economy, were born. So Marx was a witness and also an activist in exactly that period which formed our modern world, our modern society, and therefore, in uh, my biography, where the first volume will appear this year, I, ga I gave it the title Marx and the Birth of Modern Society to stress this connection. Marx was a witness of this birth and at the same time he was an activist. He was involved in the political processes, he was involved in the processes of organization. And this has consequences for his, also his main theoretical texts. Also, these main theoretical texts show a double character. They are, on the one hand, an intervention to certain conflicts, to certain debates of the time. And, on the other hand, they are an analysis of some general structures, of structures which survived until today. And we have to have in mind always this double structure, this, this double character uh, of the texts. Of course, this signature of the time also um, is a part of his analysis of the general structure. This analysis is formed of his knowledge of the time, and his knowledge is changing. Marx was a learning subject all his lifetime. This was, for me, uh, one of the most fascinating aspects working on his biography, how open he was, how ready he was also to overthrow um, things he learned in the past and to start new from, from a new point. That we have now so much manuscripts never published in his lifetime 
has its cause, not only that he didn't found publishers, he had publishers in, in several periods of his lifetime, but he himself refused to publish because he was not satisfied, because he learned something new. Um, but in the main readings of 20th century, such aspects were underestimated. In 20th century, we see a lot of Marxists stressing materialism, that they have a materialist uh, approach to reality. But when it comes to reading Marx, I would say many readings in uh, the 20th century were a very idealistic reading of Marx, and not a materialist reading. Um, it starts already with an objective problem that in 20th century, every generation of readers knew a different Marx. For example, Rosa Luxemburg or Lenin, they didn't know the writings of the young Marx. Or important Marxists, Marxist economists, at least when they were in, in their active time, like uh, Henrik Grossman, they didn't know Grundrisse. And on, only nowadays, since the 1990s, we know the original manuscript of volume three of Capital since 2008, also the original manuscripts of volume two. And we can see there that the original manuscript and the edition provided by Engels show a lot of differences, and differences not only in some small nuances, only interesting some experts. So now, um, after the mega, the big Marx Engels um, Gesamtausgabe, which is not completed until now, but it is on a good way, now, your generation, maybe not uh, we too, but uh, the, uh, the younger generation will have the possibility really to, to read the, the whole Marx, which no generation before had the chance. This is an objective problem. But in the readings of the 20th century, we also have, in some respect, subjective uh, problems, problems of the way of reading in these times. I already um, um, called this an idealistic reading, which in my view has um, several aspects. The first aspect is the search for completeness. What Marx left to us are a lot of writings and uh, manuscripts dealing with big projects he never completed. It starts already with his dissertation about some Greek uh, philosophers. It should be the opening work for a circle of writings about Greek philosophy, which in some respect he parallelized as the Po the post-Aristotelian philosophy with the post-Hegelian philosophy. But this series of writing were never published. It was not even written. It was put aside. The famous um, economic philosophical manuscripts of the year 44, where you can find the famous uh, theory of alienation, it should also be the starting point of a series of critics. The critic of economy, the critic of politics, the critic of morality, the critic of right, and so on. It was never written, it was never uh, fulfilled. And the same um, we can see with his studies about capital, there was this original six book plan, then it was changed to the four books of capital, which also never were uh, fulfilled. So what we have from Marx is uh, um, a big um, sample of monuments, like 
archaeologists find monuments which are not complete, which show the, um, um, the figure of something big, but this big project doesn't exist. In the readings of uh, 20th century, already the editors and then the readers tried to uh, hide this to complete where was not a, a complete project. And this already gave a certain bias to very different readings, but in some respect they had a, a rather similar bias. Um, there is also another bias in, in the readings of uh, the 20th century that the writings of Marx were taken out of its historical context. I spoke in, in my first sentences about the double character of also the main um, theoretical readings that they were on the one hand a political intervention, on the other hand a general analysis. This first moment that they were um, a political intervention for the theoretical readings, for the economic readings mainly, was very often overlooked and also very often Marxists, and, but also the, the critics of Marx, they not really read what they could find in the manuscripts, they read what they expected to find, what they think Marx must have uh, um, uh, did, that he must have looked, for example, to the equilibrium prize. So there is a big confusion with his value theory and the theory of price. For Marx, these were very, two very separate uh, fields of research. But uh, a lot of, especially bourgeois economists, who, who have uh, a scope focused on equilibrium price, presuppose that Marx also must be occupied with equilibrium price, but this leads to a complete misunderstanding of his theory. So, to, to make this long story short, um, in the 20th century, about of this rather biased reading, we also had um, a very strange debate about continuity or rupture in the development of Marx. In, especially in Germany, the continuity thesis prevailed that there is a starting point even in the, um, uh, the Abitur uh, essay of Marx, the, the, the last school essay, or at least from his uh, dissertation or from uh, the critique of Hegelian philosophy of a right, that there is no main change to capital. The opposite position especially was uh, articulated by Louis Althusser that there is a big rupture uh, and this rupture is a rupture between ideology of the early writings and uh, scientific writings at, uh, in, in his major period. I think when we really have a materialist reading, a very close reading, taking into account what the manuscripts are, we can refuse as well the thesis of continuity as well the thesis of rupture. Maybe this sounds a little bit surprising because this rupture or continuity sees like a a logical either or, and there is no, not a third uh, possibility, but I think there is a third possibility, when we have in mind that Marx's research was always um, done not only in one field of science of research, he always was occupied with several fields, with economy, with politics, with uh, history, in his later years also with natural sciences, with technology and with ethnology. In these different fields we can find 
ruptures, but there is not the big rupture in all fields. In one field we have continuity, in another field there is a rupture. But also there is not only one rupture. I stressed at the beginning that Marx was an extremely learning subject and this learning character provoked a number of ruptures. In so far, I refuse as well continuity, as well rupture, and when we do a periodization of his work and for practical um, purpose, sometimes we are forced to do, but we, also sh we always should have in mind every periodization of his work can be questioned with very good uh, arguments. What I, and I have to say this because now what I want to, to stress are the economic writings uh, in the period after uh, 57, also a period, but we can question this period, it doesn't form a unit. The economic writings are not the only occupation of Marx in this time. There are also important political writings. There, is, uh, there are important ethnological, historical, and uh, technological studies he did. All this I have to exclude for this presentation in, uh, in a few minutes, but I do this out of practical reason, not because I think there is really a, a unit uh, in the years after uh, 57. Um, what I want to, to stress here now in, in uh, looking to these so-called major writings, that there is also an important development and that in main readings of economic writings, there is a lot of confusion that, for example, Grundrisse, written in 57, 58, are equalized with capital, or at least uh, a lot of uh, people think, okay, in capital we cannot find an occupation with uh, this or that issue, but we can find it in Grundrisse, so let's combine. But in Grundrisse, Marx has a rather different theoretical framework from capital, and we cannot just combine some stones from here and there without looking to this different um, theoretical framework. Grundrisse, very early in Grundrisse, Marx had developed this idea of a six book plan in which he wanted to present his critique of political economy, including uh, also a critique of the history of uh, political economy. This should be included to the presentation. After presenting a central uh, category, Marx wanted to present the history of this category. And this six book plan, starting with uh, the book of Capital, was guided by a certain theoretical framework the difference between the so-called capital in general and opposed to the competition of the many capitals. Capital in general was not a direct empirical issue. You can immediately see in, in, uh, in empirical observations. Capital in general was a certain theoretical construction. It should show what makes a sum of money to capital, but without uh, dealing with the real action of capital in competition. It should show a certain theoretical content on a certain, on a certain uh, theoretical level. This concept Marx tried to apply in Grundrisse and also he tried it to apply in the next big economic manuscript, the so-called manuscript uh, of the year 61 to 63, from which the famous theories of surplus value is a part. 
And in this later manuscript of 61, 63, Marx learned that this first theoretical approach, capital in general, was not possible to hold. There's this double um, condition to present a certain content on a certain level of abstraction was not possible. This is the main result of the manuscript 61 to 63. Marx had to change this basic theoretical framework. After the year 63, you will not find this notion, capital in general, neither in manuscripts nor in published works, nor in the letters of Marx. Before, from the year 57 to 63, it was a main notion, and it completely disappeared. And this is not by accident. Marx um, conceptualized a new project, the capital in four volumes. And this capital in four volumes had as a general theoretical framework the consideration of individual capital and total social capital on different levels of abstraction. Not on one level to, to deal with individual capital, but on different levels. For example, in volume one of capital, the production process, on the level of uh, the individual capital, it was shown how capital can produce surplus value, but only in chapter 23 in the German and uh, uh, I, I suppose also Spanish edition, in chapter 25 in the English edition, he changed to the level of total social value, uh, to total social capital. Similar in, vol in volume two, the first two big sections, circulation and turnover, are um, based on consideration of the individual capital. The third uh, section is based on total social capital. So the basic framework of Grundrisse and the manuscript 61, 63, on the one hand, capital on the other hand, are rather different. It is not the same theoretical project. But not only the basic theoretical framework changed, also certain important issues cha changed. I just want to, um, to focus on two of them in order not to exceed the time too much. I will exceed, but not too much. Um, so I deal here only with crisis theory and with the monetary theory of value. Crisis theory in Grundrisse is rather different from crisis theory in capital. In Grundrisse, or not only in Grundrisse, also before the whole 1850s, Marx expected a coming crisis which will bring nearly the breakdown, the collapse of capitalism, and a revolutionary overcome. It rested on his interpretation of the revolution of 48. He saw the revolution of 48 as a result of a capitalist crisis we saw in 47. And now he expected a new crisis which will bring an even a uh, stronger uh, shakening of capitalism and even stronger revolutionary actions. And in Grundrisse, he tried to give theoretical uh, foundation of this um, uh, collapse crisis. Perhaps you, you know the famous uh, fragment on machinery there he tried to show that um, mode of production resting on value necessarily has to collapse because this value foundation is undermined and when the value foundation disappears also the, uh, the capitalist, capitalist system would collapse. The crisis in 57, 58, as uh, Gareth Stedman-Jones already 
uh, told us was a very uh, strong uh, experience to Marx. He learned that a crisis has not only destructive uh, power to capitalism, no, it has also reconstructive power. He had to learn that the crisis uh, of 57, 58, on the one hand, it was the first world economic crisis, we can say it was a crisis in all the main capitalist countries, but on the other hand, it was rather short, it was overcome rather quickly, and capitalism after this crisis was much stronger than capitalism before crisis. And Marx, as a learning subject, draw the consequences. He gave up his idea of a collapse crisis. You will not find this. What, in some respect, um, was put uh, as a substitute was this law of the falling rate uh, of profit, which should not give uh, reason to a collapse, but to a limitation of the, the development of the, of the capitalist development, a kind of imminent limit of the um, possibilities of capitalism to develop. This idea already um, he started with in Grundrisse, in rather vague terms. <coughs> it, <coughs> it became stronger in the manuscript 61, 63, and in the manuscript of uh, volume three of Capital, the manuscript was written in the year 64, 65, I think is it, it is on uh, the top of its development. There you can find the most extensive treatment of this um, law of the profit rate. But what happened then? The last time Marx mentioned this law was in a letter to Engels in 68, where he just sketched the content of volume three. And in the 1870s, Marx was occupied a lot with crisis and crisis theory, but he never mentioned this law of the profit rate. Contrarily, in his uh, personal uh, copy of volume one, there is a small note in the uh, section on accumulation which expresses exactly the opposite of the law of this profit rate, there he states that the profit rate of capital with, which has a bigger organic composition is higher than the profit rate of a capital with a lower organic composition. This note was included by Engels in the uh, third edition of Capital, which Engels provided after Marx's death, but it was a very isolated footnote and it was not recognized by readers. You all can read this. You will find it in, in your Spanish translation in, in the section on, uh, on accumulation, uh, but because it was so isolated, nobody knew really what does it mean. Maybe one evening, Marx drank too much and he confused things. Who knows? But now, with Mega, we have the publication of all his manuscripts related to capital, manuscripts he wrote after publication of um, volume one and after uh, writing the manuscript of volume three. And there are a lot of manuscripts where he is uh, occupied with numerical examples about the um, connection of the rate of surplus value, um, surplus value related to variable capital, and the rate of profit. There is even a manuscript 
of, um, he, he wrote in the year 1875, in, in Mega, it has 150 printed pages, mainly numerical examples, but as Marx uh, formulated it, with the, um, the claim to investigate the laws of the profit rate. Among these laws of the profit rate, the famous law of the tendency of the falling profit rate doesn't appear anymore. And when you look to his number examples, you can see that Marx learned by these many examples that it was not at all clear that when the constant capital is growing in relation to the variable capital, that this will guarantee a falling rate of profit. No, everything can happen. The profit rate can fall down, but also it can go up and it can remain stable. And after all these manuscripts where Marx, under the law of the profit rate, never mentioned the falling profit rate, where he had all these uh, number examples, now I would say this isolated remark in his uh, uh, private copy of Capital, which Engels uh, inserted in the third edition, is not a note which he wrote down when he drank a few glasses uh, of port wine too much. It was really the result of his learning process. And so I think as well as he throw over, he, he, he um, get rid of the original theory of collapse, Marx also get rid of this famous law of the profit rate uh, to fall. Nevertheless, he stayed he, uh, to, to crisis theory. He had several uh, approaches to crisis theory which were not connected with any laws of the profit rate. Just contrary, the, the theory of crisis and in reality the process of crisis was the basic thing which governed the profit rate, not the profit rate governs the crisis. The opposite is the result. We have a, a process of um, of crisis, which starts with a high profit rate. When Marx speaks about over-accumulation, that too much capital is accumulated, how is this possible? Because we have a, a high profit rate. So the falling profit rate, when it happens in reality, and it happens very often, is not a precondition of crisis, it is a consequence of crisis. And therefore, this law of the profit rate, which in my view, there are strong hints that Marx dropped this law, it is not really a loss. We don't need it for a theory of crisis. So, uh, how much time can I, can I have? Uh, One hour? Yeah, <laughs> Okay, I, I try to to use not more than five, six minutes. Just uh, to come to my second issue, I wanted to, um, to present monetary theory of value. I already said Marx value theory has to be distinguished from any price theory, also from a theory of equilibrium price. For Marx, equilibrium price was a very subordinated case he dealt with in volume three of Capital, but the main thing was the connection between value and money. In all the classical theories of value in Adam Smith, in David Ricardo, as well in modern neoclassical theories, I don't know if anybody is studying economics nowadays here in this room, you, then you know what I'm talking about, as well in the classical theories, as well in neoclassics, money plays no crucial role. They deal in, in the classics with 
and not monetary theory of value. Neoclassical theory not even deals with value, they deal with uh, physical amounts, which they call capital. And money comes only as something additional afterwards, which has not really a theoretical significance. They tell you in practical um, everyday life, of course, money makes uh, transactions more easy. But when we look from a theoretical point of view, we are not necessarily need to take money into account. Marx, in opposite, tries to present a monetary theory of uh, value in which production and exchange basically is connected. Uh, and in this basic connection, value, when it is not a, an attribute of a single commodity, and Marx later came to an explicit critic of such a restricted value theory, when it is not an attribute of a single commodity, when it is a universal relation between all of the commodities, this universal relation needs not only of out of practical reason, it needs basically the relation to money. This idea was already expressed in 1859 in a contribution to the critique of political economy. But there, the famous two chapters, there was a confusion between value uh, form analysis, the analysis of the pure form, and the analysis of the exchange process, the process of action. And so Marx had to refine this value form analysis, and he reached it only in uh, the first edition of uh, Capital in the year 67. The big achievement in value theory of this first uh, edition is the clear separation of the form analysis in analyzing the commodity and the analysis of action, of human action, in the analysis of the exchange process. When you read now you cannot read the, the first edition, but even when you read the, the second or the fourth edition, which usually is translated, you will find that there is even a clear um, terminological difference between chapter one and chapter two. In chapter one, Marx only speaks of the exchange relation. And the exchange relation deals with commodity, not with persons. In chapter two, he speaks of exchange relation, uh, of ex not of exchange relation, he speaks of the exchange process. And this exchange process deals with persons. So there is a clear um, difference between the analysis of form and the analysis of action, and the analysis of action is governed by the analysis of form. But also, this very much improved uh, presentation in the year 67 has a, a, a deficit. And this is the treatment of value substance. Marx realized this in the so-called reworking manuscript. When he prepared uh, the second edition of Capital, the German second edition, which appeared in the years 72-73, uh, he wrote a manuscript where he did the main changes for value theory and he commented himself. The reworking manuscript, neither a part of uh, the first edition nor a part of 
the second edition. It is a manuscript of its own. It is a self-commentary of Marx. And there he explicitly stated that in his own presentation, there can be a misunderstanding that value is an attribute of the single commodity, of the single labor product. But this is wrong. Value exists only in the relation where the different labor products count as equal. And this relation, as we all know, is the exchange relation. So in this manuscript, you find a clear um, refutation of the idea that value is already determined by production. It is not determined only by production. Production plays a role, but not the only role. And you find the refutation of the idea that value is, the, um, is an attribute of the single value. This manuscript, um, unfortunately, is not very much translated. It is translated in the um, Italian uh, new edition of Capital, uh, volume one of Capital, there is uh, edited in two big volumes by Roberto Fineschi. Um, and in the, the commentary, my commentary to, to the beginning of Capital, which was mentioned at the beginning, which is translated in Spanish, at least the translation of this self-commentary paragraphs, four printed pages mainly, is translated in Spanish. So you can check my arguments by yourself reading this text in Spanish. The second edition of uh, Capital then is a kind of very unlucky combination of these certain tendencies. On the one hand, it brings important improvements which rest on this reworking manuscript. For example, in the paragraph dealing with uh, fetishism, there is a big paragraph which, which uh, starts with the consideration that uh, labor product only receive its objectivity as values Wertgegenständlichkeit, I say this in German because objectivity is not the best translation or not a, a fitting translation, um, that this value objectivity is only reached in exchange. Nevertheless, there are a lot of old formulations where you can have the impression that value is the result of only the, um, the production. And then from this follows the um, beloved game of Marxists, let's quote uh, quotations. I have uh, three quotations giving favor to production. You have uh, two quotations giving favor that uh, production is not the only reason. I am right because I have three quotes and you have only two quotes. Uh, but understanding Marx is not a football game where you can count uh, goals. You have to understand the logic of the theory and especially the logic of the development of the theory. And the development, I think, is rather clear to show no, this orientation to production has to be overcome. It is misleading. Now, just to, to say as um, the last uh, uh, sentence, what do we have from this monetary theory of, um, product of, of value? I already stressed it is not a theory of equilibrium price. It is a theory of the socialization of a commodity producing society. A commodity producing society is, in the very literal sense, something mad. You have, on the one hand, a universal 
connection by a universal division of labor. Everybody depends on anybody else. But on the other hand, you have atomized producers. Producer, it can be the single producer, it can be also the single capitalist um, company. They are single producers who compete in the market. So you have universal dependency and at the same time the behavior as if you have a lot of Robinsons. How, nevertheless, this can work? And the monetary theory of um, value is the answer, how this can work, what kind of socialization happens. And in this context, the notion of fetishism plays a crucial role. Fetishism is not just a kind of ideological superstructure. No, the opposite. Fetishism has nothing to do with ideology. Ideology is um, a different level of consideration. Fetishism is something in the, when, when you uh, use the very problematic uh, terms of basic and superstructure, it is something which belongs to the basis of the society and not to the superstructure. All this is revealed in this monetary theory of, um, of value. It also has consequences for capital and credit. I cannot uh, explain now. It gives an understanding of capitalism, which I think is very viable, very important today, very uh, fruitful today. We can use this, but we have to overcome the simplified and biased readings of capital which prevailed in the 20th century. Thank you very much for your attention so long.